Thank you very much for that. And um, welcome, everyone. My name is Jeroen Auerhand. I am a partner in our Amsterdam office in the Netherlands, uh, but I am also the firm's uh, senior partner. I'm very privileged to be opening this panel discussion uh, today. Um, let me start off by saying that, first of all, Clifford Chance is really a proud supporter of the armed forces community. And I think we are fortunate to have many veterans in the firm and many current reservists in the firm. And, uh, I would count myself as a reservist, definitely not a veteran, because I haven't been in any uh, war zone or uh, I've only been in um, military service uh, many years ago as a uh, platoon commander of reconnaissance platoon. Um, and I feel uh, humbled to be today in the presence of veterans who have spent time uh, in, in Afghanistan, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, I got pretty close to being sent to uh, Kuwait in the first Kuwait war. Uh, that never happened uh, to the relief of, of uh, certainly many family members around me. So again, that's why I'm uh, humbled to be in the presence today of some of our veterans who sit on the panel who are drawn from the US, the Netherlands and the UK. And although military forces have now been withdrawn from Afghanistan, I think the positive lessons our panelists have learned from their time spent in Afghanistan uh, will be very interesting to hear and how they have incorporated the lessons they have learned being on active duty there into their daily practices now at Clipper Chance, um, I hope will be inspiring and, uh, and informative for all of us listening today. Uh, we have uh, a great number of attendees watching this panel today from, I was just watching a number of countries that have joined uh, from, from all over uh, the world, particularly from Europe, but also from the US um, and from India and elsewhere. So that is great. And thank you very much all for joining. So whilst events like this are really important for us, there's also a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes within the chance. Um, and some evidence of that is that the UK government has recently awarded the firm gold status in the Defence Employer Recognition Scheme, which we are very honoured by. And that recognises the support we have provided in a range of areas, uh, from recruitment into the legal industry of military personnel to our pro bono work, including for the Invictus Games Foundation that I'm sure many of you have heard of. So. Um, I am uh, very much hoping that you will enjoy this event and um, with that short introduction and without further ado, I'm going to hand over to uh, Dorian uh, Drew and Amy Baird, who are our moderators for today. So uh, I'll start by handing over to you, Dorian. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jeroen. And um, however you must feel about being in the presence of Afghan veterans, um, I only spent two years in our reserves when I was at university and a number of years as a child following my um, parents around Germany as they were posted from various army posting to army posting, so you can imagine how I feel. Um, we are incredibly lucky to be joined by five Clifford Chance um, members of legal staff who have, as Yuri has said, spent time um, in Afghanistan. And so without further ado, I'm going to introduce them or ask them to introduce themselves. So if we can start with you, um, Ben Lee, if you could introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. My name is Ben Lee. I'm an associate in the New York office. Uh, and between 20, 2010 and 2011, I served in Kandahar as a civil affairs officer. Uh, our, civil affairs officer our civil affairs corps is uh, sometimes called non-kinetic work uh, by other uh, branches. Um, hearts or minds, we weren't picky which one we got. And staying with the United States, Latiz, I wonder if you could introduce yourself. Good morning, everyone. My name is Latiz Tangerlini. I'm an associate in our New York office. I work in the litigation department, specifically working in white collar crime and regulatory matters. Matters. Um, I deployed to Afghanistan in 2014. I was in Bagram. I worked primarily with key, uh, facilitating key leader engagements to the command. Uh, so that meant helping our general when he needed to leave and do um, area travel, but as well as helping individuals um, come into a program as well. Thank you, Latiz. And so now moving over uh, the Atlantic, um, Jeroen Koltoff, I was wondering if you could introduce yourself now. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Jeroen Koltoff, and I'm an associate in our banking and finance team in our Amsterdam office. Um, between 2008 and 2012, I was a soldier in the Dutch Armed Forces, where I was part of our Air Patrol Brigade which is a small infantry combat unit uh, in reconnaissance and airborne operation. Um, and as a private first class, I was deployed to the Uruguay province of Afghanistan in 2010 as part of the ISAF mission, which is the International Security and System. Thank you, Yuri. And so I have to say, I'm glad that uh, social distancing has allowed us to be joined in person. 
um, in here in London by um, two associates. So, um, first, Michael, if I could ask you, um, what, what was your connection with Afghanistan? Hi, everyone. I'm Michael Yarney. I'm a current trainee solicitor sitting in the London Private Funds Group. Um, between 2007 and 2012, I served as a Royal Marines Commando. Um, and in 2010, I had done a six-month tour serving as a section machine gunner um, in the town of Sangin, Helmand Province. And, um, and James Law. Hello, everyone. My name is James Law. I'm a senior associate in the real estate department here in London. Uh, before becoming a solicitor, I was in the British Army, and uh, I served with my regiment, uh, Coldstream Guards, in the Helmand Province in Afghanistan in 2007. Uh, I, my primary role was, was infantrying, uh, but like Ben, I also did uh, some non-kinetics work, which was essentially um, going out on patrol and developing relationships with uh, local Afghans. Thank you. And um, so, as Jeroen said, I'm co-moderating uh, this afternoon with Amy Bird, who's a senior associate. Um, Amy, would you like to introduce yourself and kick off with the question? Thanks very much, Dora, and thanks very much, everybody. So, yes, I'm Amy Bird. I'm a senior associate in the employment team at Clifford Chance. And my connection with the Armed Forces Network is that my husband is currently serving in the Royal Navy. Um, I've heard a lot about his military experience over the years, but I've been absolutely amazed and inspired to hear in our rehearsal sessions from <coughs> the experiences of our veterans in Afghanistan. So I'm really delighted to be able to share with you their experiences today, and hopefully people will get insight for themselves as to how those personal reflections can help them in their daily lives. So the first thing I'd really love to hear about and for our audience to hear about is those first impressions that our panellists heard um, and gained on arriving in Afghanistan. And I'd really like to come to Yeroen first on screen about this. And Yeroen, can I ask you, when you first arrived in Afghanistan, what was your main impression and, and what has stuck with you since you've been there? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And many thanks, Amy. Um, but one thing I still remember very well from, from just the first... Uh, few moments I, I entered Afghanistan, I stepped out of the military aircraft that, that had flown us into the country, is that like within a few minutes I already saw a, a bunch of helicopters taking off and there were constantly just fire jets flying on and off as well. And when I was walking there wearing my helmet and, and, and my personal weapon, I just realized that, that this, all of this was probably not an exercise because those were actual fighter jets taking off, uh, well, flying to, I don't know where, to engage an enemy. So reality really kicked in within a few minutes, and I realized then and there that yeah, I was about to be part of it. Thank you for that reflection. That's been really striking for you. If I come, Michael, to you now potentially about um, what you first felt when you arrived there, where that sense of kind of being in a war zone resonates with you. So my first sort of initial impressions were sort of built in Camp Bastion. Um, it was just sort of like a really large uh, military base and. My only lasting thought really there was how hot it was. Um, I'd done a, I conducted a summer tour. Um, but we flew, shortly flew into um, a forward operating base just on the edge of um, the town Sangin that we were going to sort of work from. And we were swiftly put into a back of a, like an armoured truck uh, called a Mastiff. Um, and we were all sitting on the floor. Um, we had to sort of be transported to our patrol base that we were going to work out of in the town, which was probably best described it's just like a large detached house in the middle of like an urban area with some fairly large walls around it um, but we couldn't we didn't really get any time to sort of take in our surroundings um, and we were just driving down this road with no windows sort of bumping along we knew it was quite a hostile area um, and we, we were going to be in for some a warm welcome um, and it was just I remember the sort of almost fear and the sort of the emotions of all of us sort of looking at each other, not, not knowing what was going on around us, sort of not knowing the environment we were driving through. And it was almost an intrigue as well of sort of what to get out. And I, I sort of vividly remember just sitting in that truck and not, not much was said. Everyone was sort of just waiting for sort of to get there, the doors to open. And then when we got there, it was, I remember sort of seeing this, we were in this valley, of Sangin was located in this valley and you had this river going down. And literally one side was like the urban area and then the other side was this lush green, green fields and agriculture. And um, it's just quite striking. It's something that's sort of 
sticks with me sort of even now just that that sort of move up and getting out the doors and sort of seeing where we were going to be spending our next six months very hot six months <laughs> you've touched on, on the landscape there and i think when we've got as a, a backdrop to session today some some pretty kind of rugged mountainscape um, James, do you want to give us a reflection on kind of what it was like arriving there and, and kind of what the landscape was like and, and what was running through your mind? Yeah, I, I mean, very similar to Mike, actually, um, in the sense that w one thing that surprised me was um, Afghanistan's a beautiful country and, and Helmand was no different. Um, uh, but it did surprise me the, how, it, you know, its, it's, it's history meant that uh, a lot of what we're used to in the West uh, the, was, was absent, and um, uh, the, um, the, 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 all the land was cultivated. You know, it's an agrarian subsistence economy there, and, um, and, and, and it was beautiful, but um, the farmers were, well, almost all the local Afghans were farmers, and every bit of land that there was was cultivated. Uh, and that really struck me, actually, um, as something which you just don't see, certainly in England. No, it, it must have been really kind of striking difference. And I, I'm, I'm sure coming to, to our people um, on, on screen across the Atlantic, um, Ben, if I can come to you, I mean, what was your first impression of, of arriving and, and um, what we've heard from panelists so far, does that resonate with you? Um, well, certainly, I, I, as, as the others have said, uh, there was very much a moment of landing for me at Kandahar Airfield and actually then climbing into a Black Hawk and being flown out to my base. And uh, yes, this moment of being like, oh, well, this is real. Um, and this is... I am. This is not a training exercise, and this is an actual uh, combat deployment. Uh, and I think, as it settled in, though, it was this sense of both the danger and the normalcy that for the Afghans. Who, uh, my job was to get into the population as often as possible, so I was often out patrol almost every day. Uh, and for them, this was normal. This was every day to have troops in their country. Um, I remember once I was walking down the street with a, a combat patrol with another lieutenant. And we buy a loaf of naan from a tandoor oven. It's three feet long. It's a giant loaf of bread. And we're walking along. We're tearing off pieces of it and giving it to the children uh, as we're walking along. And uh, just this this odd sense of place that we're on a combat patrol. And it's, it's both very dangerous and we're also giving bread to children. Um, and uh, the juxtaposition stays with me to this day. Thank you. Latisse, does that resonate with you, your, your first impressions on arriving, that, that kind of dichotomy that, that Ben's has been describing. Absolutely. Um, I distinctly recall we were on a C-17, which is a rather large military aircraft. We were a bit spread out when we were flying into in country. And uh, I remember the crew telling us overhead, it's time to pack up, button down everything you've got, we're about to land. And as I got up to, to put my items away, I had an opportunity to look out the window. And Bagram is located within a vast, stunning mountain range. And I looked out and it's just absolutely beautiful. It reminds me of something I would see at home in California. Um, and it wasn't until we were all walking off of the plane and I heard the sirens that let all of the people on the base know there's incoming. It, it really jolted me back into the reality that while we were in this, this stunning mountainous terrain, we were still in an active war zone. Um, so that's definitely an experience that I had that seems to have resonated and been very similar to that of my colleagues. So uh, thank you for all of those. I, I suppose. Ben, picking up on the point that you were talking about um, in relation to the Afghan people, we've obviously heard that over the years, you know, there have been very difficult circumstances in Afghanistan for the Af Afghan people. I mean, what were your sort of impressions about, um, you know, Afghans and how they responded to the difficult circumstances that they faced um, during those years? Mm -hmm. I think it was... Um, it, it, the resilience of the people and everywhere that we had met. Uh, everyone I had met had been in a war or had anybody under 30 had grown up knowing nothing but war. Anybody who was older than 30 had only known a limited amount of peace. And so, but still the, the resilience of people were just going on about their lives uh, and still also holding on to this remarkable generosity. Um, this uh, this and also this patience with me as a I was a lieutenant with a civil the civil affairs corps being like well how can I build you a road or a school or a clinic or something to help develop the governance and they had heard all this before uh, but they were still very generous hosts and very much willing to to work with us um, and uh, 
Yeah, it was in, and very kind and, and very patient. Um, every time sitting down to tea and every time with the, the very patient three lumps of sugar because that's what you give to guests. Um, yeah, just the, the very resilient and, and, and still generous people, uh, even after all these years. And also, Ben, I, I think you developed a close relationship with the interpreter that you work with most often. I mean, can you describe that? I did. Of course. Uh, so my, I, I, I did not speak Pashtun myself. Uh, so my translator was a man named Abdullah Safi. Uh, Safi was actually a little bit younger than me. Uh, he was the fourth son in his family. His father and older brothers had all died fighting the Taliban, and so he had become a translator to support his family. Uh, he and I got along famously because uh, I come from the northeastern part of America, which has a pretty flat accent, and he had learned English by watching all only American movies, where people tend to have the same sort of flat uh, accent. Uh, and so he, uh, he, he understood me very well. Uh, Die Hard was his favorite movie. Uh, so we had a lot of fun joking and quoting that back and forth to each other. Um, and yes, it, but, and same thing, that Safi thought very little of the notion that he, instead of being in university, he was there to support his family, even after his father and his brothers had all died. Uh, but that was just his role now, to step up to support his mother and his sisters and uh, his, his nieces and nephews. And uh, he, with every day with a great deal of courage, would come out with us on patrol again and again, exposing himself uh, to danger, but wanting to build a better country for his people. Well, thank you. I won't ask you whether he thought Die Hard was the best Christmas movie of all time, because I think you know, that might divert us from what we're talking about. But Michael, from your sense, what were your, you know, what were your impressions of your interactions with the Afghan people when you were out on patrol, for example? So similar to sort of some of the things that Ben's alluded to there, um, we, we had quite a lot of admiration for how they went about their lives. It was, new to us, it was my first tour, it was the first tour of a lot, of a lot of people that I served with and um, they just wanted to sort of go about their, their ordinary lives and they had a real willingness to do that, to make sure that what was going on around them, us being there, sort of going down their main road, I feel like they'd become used to it but if you had sort of like a section of heavily, heavily armoured guys walking down, down your main road then it makes your life a lot different, a lot they can't, they can't drive past us, they have to wait to sort of, until we're happy for them to move past. And they were quite patient with us um, and quite good with us. And they accept, maybe accept's the wrong word, but they sort of, they allowed us to go about and do our jobs the way, the way we, we needed to. Uh, we had more interaction with a lot of the children in Sangin. Um, a lot of the, the seniors, I feel, were, were quite cautious um, to interact mainly with us. Um, we did have some, some guys that had done um, sort of Pashto courses um, before we'd gone out there and we did, similar to Ben, we had our own interpreters. Um, and they were the ones that would sort of sit down with the elders, the locals, and really talk about sort of the, the mission as a whole. But sort of from like the, the ground troops as such, um, our main interactions came with the children. If you sort of went down the local park in the UK and met children, or you met the children, it's saying there'd be no difference other than the language barrier. They were as happy to, about their everyday their day lives as you would be in, in the UK. Um, and they were great. Um, they always had a smile on their face. Um, yeah, so there was a lot of admiration from us with them. Um, and I believe one of the children now still has one of my Crystal Palace flags put up in this house. I hope. I hope. Lucky him or her. <laughs> um, so, James, I mean, in terms of developing those relationships, I mean, clearly Hearts and Minds is a really important aspect of um, what we were doing there. I mean, how did you seek to foster those relationships with locals? Yeah, it's a really good point because, obviously, there was a pretty serious um, language barrier and... Also, we were dressed like Robocop, so it wasn't really com sort of... It, it, we weren't set up to have particularly good face-to-face um, -face meetings straight off. Um, but uh, we, we relied on our, our interpreters a lot, and um, they were quite good at explaining why we were there and um, what we were doing, and, um, and, and did help us sort of elicit responses and develop relationships. But... Like Mike says, it was definitely the children who were most approachable and, and not fearful at all, um, certainly when we were out on patrol. Uh, but there were some other uh, approaches we took to, to 
build relations. And one thing we did was we had a, a shura or a meeting of local leaders, um, hajis and tribal leaders. And they came to us to our forward operating base. And uh, we hosted a sort of Afghan tea, uh, which was, was quite tense, actually, because there was a slight uncertainty as to whether we were letting the wrong people into our camp. And um, uh, the, uh, the, te the tent was set up, and uh, the company commander was about to start speaking, and a Chinook helicopter flew over. And the downdraft from the rotor blades blew the lid, or, or blew the canopy off the tent. And everyone was absolutely covered in sand, tea completely covered in sand. And there was then 20 seconds where there was complete silence. And I think everyone was quite concerned what was going to happen. And then all the Afghans just creased up with laughter and were rolling around on the, on the floor, you know, just in hysterics. And I just thought that was the most brilliant sort of uh, example of their wonderful characters. And, and it actually made the meeting go really well. They, were, they found it hilarious, as, as did we. So it was great. And I think it's a really interesting point there you make about kind of humour in that very stressful situation. Um, and Ben, I'd like to ask you, coming on to, to you, to thinking about relationships with colleagues in what was obviously a very um, difficult, stressful personal situation. How important was it to have that sense of humour with colleagues when you were serving? Uh, I mean, I think it was, it was, it was, it was how we got along uh, every day. Um, uh, we, we usually would try and make light of anything that we could uh, and, or, or have something of a sardonic view of it. Whenever I would walk across my little combat outpost, uh, people would ask, oh, how are you doing today? And I would always answer, just another day in paradise, uh, which never seemed to, uh, which, which always cracked people up a little bit. I thought I would say, another day, another dollar, and people would say, oh, they pay us that much? Uh, but it's, um, yeah, that, that just keeping things light, I think, was, was vital for us and um, really helped us get by every day. And I, I think from our, our previous conversations, you might have created a special sort of club while you were, were out there. Do you want to tell us a bit about that? Oh, of course. So, so my job as a civil affairs officer was to get to know as many people across the base, because I would never know, it, for the Afghans, again, we were talking, as uh, many others have said, um, this is, this our divisions of how we, we break up a city and say, well, this sector is for this unit, that sector is for that unit, those, those divisions didn't exist for them. So if somebody had a problem, what they needed was to be able to just find solutions. So my job is to get to know Lieutenant Johnson, Lieutenant Guffey, and to be able to help and make connections that way. So the way I did was um, I would buy cigars in bulk online, and I would sit out on the flight line, and as patrols would come in at night, I'd uh, flag over a friend and be like, oh, hey, you know, Lieutenant Guffey, come on over, have a, have a cigar and hang out. Uh, and I ended up calling this the Junior Officers Benevolence Association um, as, a, uh, as a way of just uh, forming a little club of, of lieutenants uh, for us to um, perhaps every now and then complain about our superiors and uh, to trade uh, trade information about what we were seeing in the city and to, to build those connections. Thank you, Rich. I'm sure it must have been, been really valuable. And, and Latisse, I'm really interested in hearing from you as well and how in this very difficult personal situation, how you kind of worked with colleagues to make people feel a little bit better perhaps and get through that situation. Yeah, definitely. I mean, like Ben, I found camaraderie to be vital to our success as well as humor. Um, so one of the things that we did often, at the end of a long day, we would huddle around. I had a small team of about six people, and we would all huddle around one laptop and try to watch a funny movie, just kind of as a way to transition from the stress of our 12 to 15 hour day into uh, the night. Although we were often woken up again by those same sirens of incoming, but it was just a nice way to kind of separate our, our work from whatever kind of personal life or semblance of a personal life we could create while while deployed. Um, and another way that we found humor was initially a camaraderie building exercise. We would all work out together and we had set out to go on, on runs around not only Bagram Airfield, but also our smaller camp. And as we've noted earlier, Bagram's at a rather high altitude. So as soon as we all arrived, we thought we were at the peak of our physical fitness. Uh, we attempted to run at our usual speed and pace and we were all quite, um, we tried to find the humor in the fact that we weren't able to run the same way we were at home because of the high altitude. So. That was also a humorous thing. It was a nice way to kind of break the ice and the tension of being deployed and um, working with a, a new team in a new environment. So we found it both fun uh, to work out together and also funny that we weren't able to work out the same way we were back at home. Um, so 
Humor, I think, is definitely something that was vital to ensuring that we stayed not stress-free, but we were able to manage our stress a bit better using humor. Thank you for sharing that. Um, and, and coming back into the room, obviously, humor will only get one so far. And I'd just be interested to, to know, um, James, I might come to you on, on this one, of, of kind of how you dealt with the kind of the difficult situations and the difficult times and, and how you got through those. Uh, yeah, I think, I think everyone responded differently, probably. Um, I, I certainly found keeping busy and having a routine and, and having a good sense of humor was important. And the British Army has a, a saying that if you don't have a sense of humor, you shouldn't have joined. And um, there's a certain amount of that. Uh, because there were some bleak times, so obviously it was nice to, to have camaraderie and, um, uh, and, and close friends who you could, you know, process uh, what's happened, what, what might have happened that day with. Um, but generally, in terms of sort of practical things, we would, we would uh, you know, try and read or play cards or write letters. Uh, and obviously, where we were, we weren't able to just use our mobiles or anything. So uh, it, was, it was the best way to correspond, really, uh, with, with fam friends and family at home. And uh, the, 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 there was a sat phone, but you couldn't use that um, because you might give away, well, you could use it, but you couldn't really use it very much, and you certainly couldn't say what you were up to. So, so letters were best, and uh, on the one or a couple of occasions I did use the sat phone, you know, it was quite, it's quite difficult to speak to someone when you're, or family, when they're not, they've got no context as to where you are, and you're not just a, a short, easy jet flight away from home. Um, so letters were, were really good, actually, and I, I wrote lots, probably more than I ever have. <laughs> and I think like, you also um, had the experience of writing letters. Do you want to, to share about yeah, that? Yeah, so um, I used to write letters uh, constantly, really, whilst I was out there. Um, I didn't really use the sat phone. Um, I had a girlfriend at the time, and my mum, but I always found it really difficult to sort of explain how I was or what was going on over the phone because they'd ask, obviously they'd ask lots of questions um, that I wasn't necessarily going to be comfortable speaking about but we used to have, yeah, these things called blueies, these blue letters that you sort of wrote, wrote on and then you could sort of stick them all together and send them off and that was our, that was my main way of communicating and there was a time after, after a few traumatic events had happened and I wrote a letter to my uncle um, and I sort of described how I was feeling, what was going on. So I sort of painted a truthful picture and um, I sort of felt like I was really struggling to cope at that moment in time whilst I was writing that letter. And then by the time I sort of finished writing the letter, I felt this sort of wave of like, emotions change on, over me and um, I felt immediately better. I hadn't finished the letter, but it was just getting it off my chest while I was sort of had pent up. Um, so I, instead of screwing up the letter and putting it in the bin, I sort of changed the tone of the letter to my uncle and was like, I know what I've just said over the last sort of three, four paragraphs doesn't sound too good, but I'm feeling remarkably better now. Um, and so I finished off the letter. I said, you don't need to worry about everything I've just said, but I'm still going to send it to you for you to read. Um, and yeah, I, I sent it off. I posted it. It felt a bit strange sort of sending it, but yeah. So really helped me deal with what I was going through. And to add to that, that was sort of something we'd done within the team. I know we, it's been said about the sort of the humour element, but we had something a bit more formal, it seems, than a lot of other people um, in, in the Marines at the time. We, we used to do this thing called TRIM, which is Trauma Risk Management. And what we'd do after a traumatic event, um, we'd all sit down, it was like peer-led, so it wasn't sort of... You didn't feel uncomfortable. You were speaking to your peers. You were speaking to people who were there at that moment with you, or it could be others from another section. You, you might meet up at a, a larger base down the road and speak to others that weren't necessarily at that event. Um, and it was a really good way of everyone sort of putting it out there, how they were feeling, without feeling judged by someone who wasn't there. You probably see often when people talk about their feelings, they, they can't relate to the person they're saying it to. So they, they, sort of don't express themselves honestly. We found that really helpful, um, just sort of getting it out there. 
and I find I still do that now with the people I served with over a decade ago in Afghanistan. We still meet up for a, a, a beer or some food, and we still have them similar conversations, even though it's not as formal as it sort of maybe was back then. And it, it really helps sort of everyone just sort of deal and relax and just speak their mind. And yeah, I feel like, yeah, just talking about things really has sort of taken it forward in my in my career to date, really. And so that's something you think that, you know, now at the firm, being able to communicate with people and, and talk, is that something that you try to do? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Um, so now, sort of, as a trainee solicitor, <laughs> on a different sort of scale, but I still feel this sort of nervous and sort of worried sometimes as I do um, back then but over sort of law school and within sort of more recently the, the my trainee cohort whether it be within my department or sort of within our, our cohort talking to the other trainees I'm, I generally feel I'm quite honest and open with how I'm feeling if I'm struggling with certain things um, I've never wanted to be one of those people that says everything's going really well when I'm flying when it's when it's not because I feel like I feel so much better in myself if I'm open and I do use that all the time and I feel like then I found other trainees are a bit more open with me as they might not necessarily be with others. You build up them really close support groups and some of the people in law school who I, I haven't worked with so far in since becoming a trainee in London, but I've still got really close bonds where sort of we bounce off each other if I'm. If I'm having a bad day, I can sort of give them a team's call and, yeah, so, yeah, I've really used it moving forward and I noticed um, in my short career after the military and the emergency services, they were really, there was a real focus on bringing that sort of thing into to there and I feel like the Marines is a bit of a trendsetter there and I feel like it could it can work across the board, not just the, the military or the emergency services, but in any walk of life when when people are struggling or, yeah. It's really positive to hear. Well, Michael, I have, I have to say, as a trainee, if you're willing to have people change the tone of your letters, you're very welcome to uh, <laughs> to come to litigation. I, I'd del be delighted to have you as, as my trainee. Although I think your sense of humour is somewhat probably going to be suspect if you think that you're able to influence people by um, giving them a, a you know a, a football shirt from uh, Crystal Palace. <laughs> but anyway, um, moving on. So. I mean, the, the reference that you made to Blueys actually resonates with me because shortly after the Falklands War back in 1982, my father was posted, I think, for four months down to the Falklands. And he sent loads of those Blueys and sometimes sent photos as well. And one of the things that he used to talk about was how he dealt with the boredom of, um, of being in the Falklands. I think in his case, it revolved around um, learning to play golf uh, on a golf course where the bunkers were in fact shell holes, um, learning to play bridge and then becoming um, quite fond of Drambui. I think possibly at the same time as playing bridge, probably not the, the golf. But, um, just wondering, Jeroen, from your perspective, you know, how did you deal with you know, boredom, which I can imagine there must have been times when things were you know, very intense, but other times when you know, you're sort of struggling to find things to do? Yeah, no, there, there's lots of boredom in the army, uh, lots, lots of waiting, always. Um, and what we, well, there was a couple of things that we uh, that we then did. Uh, I think sports mostly, um, and depending on whereas we would be on the main army base where you had an actual gym where you could work out, or if you're in a uh, forward operating base and you use just spare wheels of vehicles uh, to, to put some weights on. So um, you, you try different things: uh, reading, playing cards, just a little game of football, uh, endless conversations always. Uh, and, and we also used uh, well to, to, to keep uh, pets, spiders, and, and, and scorpions, and you know uh, just just kill off some time. And um, um, but but yeah, you, you create a special bond even in that boredom um, because you, you're stuck with each other. And we didn't have like smartphones back then, or um, and and just as James also said, you could use a set phone every now and then, but it was really an exception. And, when you talk over a, um, a, a satellite phone, then um, there, there, there's just a little bit of delay in, in, in uh, when uh, the people on the other side receive what, what you've been telling them. So uh, within like a few seconds, you would talk through each other, which, which, which made it very hard to, to get a real conversation starting. Um, yeah, in the Army, there's lots of boredom, absolutely. 
I say so you're in. I mean, you're in a sort of a, um, a dangerous enough place as is. Are you, sorry, did I hear right that you tried to turn a scorpion into a pet? Yeah. So you had lots of like centipedes and spiders and, and, and scorpions, and we we just keep them for for a day or, or whenever they escape. And we, I think it's a real army thing. Uh, Mike was a, a great story about this too, uh, but. We would also just set them up, uh, uh, fighting each other and place bets on them. Uh, it's just a very, very strange thing to do, but uh, yeah, something we, we did quite often. And, uh, you know, give them names and just try to feed them. But they always, always escape, of course, but uh, yeah, it's something we, we try to do, yeah. I think we might have to leave that there, otherwise I think the RSPCA are probably going to uh, get on to us. <laughs> um, Latiz, my sense is, with what you were doing, you, you probably didn't have much time to, to get bored, but um, you've obviously referenced watching films to unwind, but I mean, from your perspective, was it pretty much full on 24-7? We were rather busy, but in the Army in the US, we have this phrase, hurry up and wait. So there were often times when I would be waiting on the tarmac for a key leader or a visitor to come to the command. Um, and there are often times when we would be on foot waiting for people to get out of meetings. Um, so some of the ways that we coped with boredom in those instances, when we were on foot waiting for people to get out of meetings, there was Bagram was rather built up, so unlike uh, the experiences of some of my colleagues, we had some of the creature comforts of home. And on Bagram, there was a green bean coffee shop, and it was kind of like a coalition Starbucks and somewhere that we could go to not work on screenplays, but instead unwind and chat with our colleagues and talk about, talk about the day. And then when we were on the flight line, I found a way to cope with boredom that was excellent, was to talk to the people that actually worked on the flight line that I often was just waving to when I was in a hurry with visitors. So I got to engage with uh, other soldiers, other coalition forces that worked in those areas uh, when I did have some moments of downtime. And what about you, Ben? I'm, I'm presuming, you know, smoking your cigars, which I'm sure were not Cuban, uh, would have been um, something that would help you pass the time. But did you, you know, did you have particular coping mechanisms? Um, well, besides the, besides just the camaraderie of, of being with other folks on the base and, and having actually that outlet of uh, being able to again have that, that quiet time with it for a cigar with some of the, uh, my fellow junior officers, um, I acquired and I forget exactly how, but I think it was my NCOs made a few deals that were better off not telling me about. Uh, I managed to acquire a dartboard for our, for our little office on base. So we had our main base in the center of the city, and then I went out to combat outposts usually throughout the week. But when I got back onto our main post, we had this dartboard, and uh, I would play a, 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 every night with Specialist Burnham, one of my basically one of my drivers. Uh, he and I would play darts, best two out of three, cricket with, I think uh, we were scoring up to 300 uh, with a call your shot rule. So suffice to say, I think I may have played like a thousand games of darts uh, when I was in Afghanistan. Now, whenever I go out to a pub, people are like, oh, you want to play darts? I'm like, oh, well, yeah, I've played once or twice here and there. Uh, I guess I'll, we'll give it a go. I, I don't know if, I, if I'm any good. Uh, so still, still uh, have that skill set to hustle the occasional game of darts. You may not be any good at darts, but you're probably fitter than the average darts player. So I suppose that's one thing in, in your favour, Amy. Uh. Thanks. So I, I think just, just hearing about that, and, you know, it's great to hear kind of how, how you dealt with the board. And we've talked about, um, you know, some situations of how you would deal with stress. But I just wanted to come back to this kind of sense of everybody being in it together and this sense of communication. Um, and Irun, coming to you, I mean, how important was it that other people were experiencing the same situations as you? And, and, and what did you draw from that to, to deal with the stress of the situation? Well, it, it is true what they say about special bonds uh, that develop uh, uh, during deployment. I mean, um, sometimes I, I don't see the guys I was there with for, for months or years and then uh, both you meet up with you, uh, again uh, just for a reunion or just uh, a little uh, beer or something and um, uh, there's just there's always that, that understanding between uh, between those people and it really helps in, in, in processing things and, and, and also stress relief just just to talk about it so yeah, it's really important that you have people around you who, who, who experience the same and, and, and to keep those those bonds uh, alive and, and you know um, and just just to meet up very regularly yeah and what's really struck me is hearing, you know, this, this idea of, of training scorpions was a, a new one on me. And I've heard you talk about the scorpions. And, and Michael, you, you talked about the scorpions. And I think to me, this just kind of resonates, this idea of bringing people together in a shared space and actually hearing your kind of experiences were, 
were very different, but actually had similar things. I mean, but that sense of kind of sharing stories and shared communications, um, you know, it must be very important, I think. Yeah, as Sharon says, I feel comfortable. Um, I don't discuss sort of like my experience in Afghan much. This is quite new to me. Um, but if you put me in a room sort of with the people I served with or people who have been to Afghanistan before in whatever role, but in some sort of role, then I feel comfortable speaking to them. Um, I feel like they will understand the things that I have sort of gone through, even if they weren't there or the things their tour might not be comparable. But I feel like there's that shared sort of experience. Um, as you already said about the scorpions, I, I did keep a scorpion for a little while. Um, to fight off the camel spiders, um, but he didn't take too well to the to the ten man ration packs that I was trying to feed him. Um, so I had to let let a scorpion go back his way. But yeah, it, it seems like no matter the humour, the experiences, they they do really sort of cross over. No matter no matter the as you probably expect, just on this panel, the, our experiences are completely different, is it? But also very similar, if that makes sense. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I, I could probably speak all day with people, with the panel as such, um, and it just makes things a lot easier and a lot more comfortable. Um, and, and James, how about you? Have you found that that's something that you've been able to deploy while you've been working here? Does that resonate with, with you? Uh, definitely. I mean, the Im importance of teamwork, I think, is, is just so uh, paramount to military life. And so being able to draw on that is obviously great in, in my role now. Um, I second everything everyone said about, um, well, for example, you know, being able to catch up immediately with, with former colleagues and, and have, having that shared experience. And I think what, one of the things about um, serving in Afghanistan was that, um, in a way, everyone out there was on, the, on one giant team. And in my case, in our forward operating base, we had the, the soldiers who you were relying on in the, in the Sangha, the guard tower on the side of the base. You had the signalers, you had the artillery, you had the, the fast air, the jets. Um, you know, you re, you're relying on the whole system. You weren't just relying on, you know, your small team. So it, it really created a sort of enhanced independence, interdependence. Um, and I think that was, that, that, that was the first time I'd ever experienced being on such a cohesive team, I think. And I try to, obviously, uh, replicate that where I can. And I, I think, um, just coming to Latisse, I wonder if there's anything in talking about that interdependency and all levels of the team. I wonder if, if that resonates with you and any thoughts you'd like to share on that. Absolutely. I think that this point really goes back to what Michael was mentioning about the Royal Marines and the importance of what we call in the US battle buddies. Um, so having a peer group or a group of individuals that you can talk to and be really candid with and share your, your experience, I think that's been really important. Um, that was important for us while we were deployed. And then also something that really translates to being a, a junior litigator and associate. It's that ensuring that you're constantly communicating not only with your team, but if you're having issues with the, your peers um, at the firm as well, because they've got that shared experience, almost like the shared experience of what we've got here on this panel. I mean, you always know that there's a group of people that you can return to that will know exactly what you mean when you mention the hardships or, or experiences that you're going through. So that was something that was very important to me by being able to share that experience with my colleagues. And, and Ben, I, I think from, from your um, description earlier of, of this, this club that you initiated, it, it sounds as if that kind of that, that sharing um, was something that's very important to you as well. Absolutely, and, um, and there is certainly a rhythm that you fall into with, with working with people in that way. And, um, the closeness of those bonds. Uh, I was actually thinking of also the of how then you everyone what James was saying of it's all one big cohesive team. Um, I was involved with helping my so my translator Safi. I was involved with helping him get his mother out of Afghanistan in the final weeks uh, and working with other veterans and how uh, there was very much people falling into that sort of that those sort of same roles of everyone's part of a team. So people who I never met before, communicating with them, but they were Afghan veterans and saying, "How? what, what are you doing? How can I help you? And them saying the same to me and everyone uh, communicating very seamlessly and uh, falling right into those rhythms. And also, uh, yeah, everybody in the uh, Junior Officers Benevolence Association calling all of them up, Lieutenant Thompson, Lieutenant Hinchy, 
uh, and being like, hey, man, we got to get this thing done. Can you help out? And everyone, again, very seamlessly falling in to um, do whatever they could. Uh, very old hat rhythms, I think. And I think it's just interesting to hear you again mentioned your mm -hmm. interpreter there, because I think, James, you've had some, mm -hmm. some recent um, Yes, you you were, you were I guess I have. Uh, so in sort of thinking about what I might uh, possibly say in this event, I uh, went through some of my um, Afghanistan stuff and I, I found uh, I had a, s a small diary from when I was out there and that dropped an email address and it was my um, interpreter's email. So I, I sent up a, um, a message, not really expecting a response. This was uh, 17 years ago. Um, and no, that's not right. Anyway, a while ago, and um, uh, and he replied, and he's living with his family happily in 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 California. So uh, it was really really nice because naturally be worried about him, but yeah, in touch again, and we're staying in touch now, which is very nice. That's great. That's really good news. Um, so um, one of the things that I remember from my time as an army brat was. Um, when I lived in a, a base in Germany where we had a, an American PX, and we spent our entire time trying to get in, wangle our way into the PX so that we could um, get Kool-Aid and Hubba Bubba. Um, from your perspectives, was there anything about you know, the other um, sort of forces and sort of what they had that you sort of perhaps coveted and maybe tried to engineer to get hold of? Uh, yes. What about you, yes, Michael? Yes. What about you, Michael? <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, we, our tour was like a transition tour. At the end of our tour, we found out that the, the US forces were going to be sort of um, taking over Sangin, the, the town of Sangin. And um, they started moving into the town sort of the last three months that we were there. And um, I've never seen so many military vehicles before. Um, I think we had about four um, covering our sort of south, south of the town, our area the town and their broken down yard of vehicles was more than I'd ever seen in sort of on a British base and that was just the ones that were inoperable um, but they were getting the the forward operating base that we sort of moved back to um, towards the last few the last sort of month of the tour um, they, they expanded uh, a rate of knots and they were getting airdrops in of their their sort of equipment and their goodies and uh, we'd been living on sort of sausage and beans, brown biscuits, and um, anything we can snaffle off the, the local, the locals really, so bread and cigarettes. And um, all of a sudden, we, we were seeing people walk around this base with sort of Gatorades. And at breakfast time, instead of sort of um, beef hash, or they were sort of eating cereal, uh, Lucky Charm cereal pots. So we thought, well, how do we get our hands on some of those? Um, so we asked, we asked a troop that had the vehicles if we could borrow, borrow one of their jackals, um, which is sort of like a, a sort of convertible truck. And um, we went out to the back of the, the base. We had to get permission off the, the people on the Sanger just to make sure they didn't sort of shoot at us as we went out to the back. We went up to the, the US Forces airdrop sort of crates. And um, under the cover of darkness, we, we decided to load up on Gatorade and had protein shakes. Um, all sorts. It was it was amazing, really. We brought it all back, and we, we made a good job of sort of hiding it. And then we got a phone call shortly after from the people whose vehicle we'd used, saying, "You need to come clean. You've been caught. Um, <laughs> they're not impressed with you guys sort of helping yourselves to their Gatorade." Um, so we gave back half our hoard, um, and it was commented on how much we'd sort of borrowed. I'd say we were definitely planning on sort of giving it back. Um, and managed to keep the other half. And, um, it went unnoticed, and we had, we had a lot of very happy evil marines after that. Um, but we had to be very careful. Where I think where maybe we're, we're showing and telling a little bit too, <laughs> much, too much, Michael. I have to say, Gatorade and um, and protein shake sounds like my 16-year-old son's ideal diet. But um, <laughs> James, was there anything that anyone else had that you really coveted? Uh. I think that there's, in the army there's always a sort of competition as to who's got the best kit and uh, it was really cold, I was on a winter tour, so I was always envious of the, uh, of the people who, who seem to um, have the warmest kit. Um, I mean we had some fairly sort of trying issues with 
uh, camel bats, which are the sort of water bladders you get. You have, we had on, them on the back of our body armour, and they would actually freeze when we went out on patrol, which obviously wasn't ideal. Um, and yeah, for all the all the clobber, you could be you, you know you could be left with fairly depressing rations, and yeah, it was, it was definitely a, a yearning for better kit. Jeroen, I've got to be thinking that you know the, the Dutch army is going to look after you. Is am I right in that, or am I mistaken? Uh, no, they, 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 they do, absolutely. Um, there's a lot of news coverage always about budget cuts, but when you go on deployment, they make sure uh, you have uh, the right kit. Um, but just like uh, Michael's story, um, we also handed over to the uh, to the U.S. forces. So I was the last, second to last uh, combat unit uh, uh, from, from the Netherlands in, in, in Urzga. Um, and we... Uh, we, we did go on patrol with uh, with some U.S. troops, and uh, well, we swapped kids. So uh, back home, I still have a complete uh, U.S. uniform from uh, the 101st Airborne Division, which uh, some of, of you may know from uh, the miniseries Band of Brothers, which I used to watch as a kid, like all the time. Um, so it was a, a bit of a dream coming true to, to get that the, the screen eagle badge from from the, from the Airborne, just swapping it for for a bit of the Dutch the camouflage or whatever. So. Um, but, but it's also very, uh, I, I recognize what James said about who has the best kit and, you know, you, yeah, you, you try to swap things and, and make it better and uh, yeah, it's, the, it's something that, that happens all the time. Ben, Latiz, it sounds like everyone's coveting uh, American gear. I mean, <laughs> it, was it all Oakley sunglasses and, you know, other things <laughs> like that or, or is it a bit harder than we all think it might have been? Ben, what do you think? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think that in the U.S. Army, we thought it was hard, but I suppose I thought I had it hard in the U.S. Army, and then I met people in the Canadian Army and the British Army, and I was like, oh, no, 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 I'm spoiled. So uh, that's, um, I think that we, I, I was actually thinking of a story of where the, the, plen the bounty of, of the U.S. supply chain, uh, my clever NCOs, the same ones who managed to acquire a dartboard for me, uh, had managed to do something that was almost out of Catch-22. We were the 411 Civil Affairs Battalion, but Civil Affairs is a type of special operations group. I'm not a cool guy. I can't jump out of helicopters or anything like that, but uh, it's a special ops model. So a battalion in a Civil Affairs unit is actually the same size as a company for most people. And we were actually only one detachment of it, so we were really a platoon, about 40 people. But Sergeant Lempert's convinced supply that we were a full-fledged battalion with 800, tro with 800 troops so we got a draw of 800 troops worth of Gatorade and protein shakes and Lickies and Chewies and all the rest of that. So we come into the base with like two full trucks worth of things uh, to the very envious looking Canadians uh, who had been living on exactly very uh, hard scrabble uh, rations and all the rest of that. Uh, and we promptly began trading them Gatorade for additional patrols and for, uh, uh, for, for other things. But yeah, just ripping the, car, the tarmac off of the the truck and it's just nothing but but goodies as far as the eye can see and we're like well the americans are here so it's fun times well michael sorry it sounds like your anecdote wasn't that impressive <laughs> after all there was plenty to go around um Latiz, just just finishing before i i hand over to amy for the last question i mean to what extent were creature comforts from home really important for you for me, they were they were vital. Um, having the creature comforts, it's tough to talk about this because I feel like I was really rather spoiled. Um, there was never a day without Lucky Charms for me in Bagram, um, but I do hear that they were tough to come by in other places. Uh, but it, it really helped to add a sense of normalcy to something that's very abnormal. Um, it's tough going every day, not speaking to your partner, your family, the people that kind of help keep you grounded. And I think having snacks, creature comforts, is a great way to remember that, um, you know, while we are in this war zone, it is temporary, and uh, it was a nice little kind of surprise or joyous thing to have while, while in, a, in a very tough, tough environment. Um, but I will say that what everyone has said is absolutely right. Gatorade daily, uh, nice cereals, a warm breakfast. Uh, so I do apologize that that was my experience and not that of, of my colleagues. So I think one, one kind of final thought that we want to end with We've heard a lot about personal reflection, so thank you very much, and, and to Mike Jakes, and how you made a, a, a bad situation um, more, more kind of personally palatable and working with your colleagues to do that. But it, the, the future of Afghanistan is obviously uncertain. 
but from a personal perspective in terms of what you've drawn for your own futures, it would be great if we could just hear one thing that you think you'll take away from that experience in Afghanistan that you can apply to how you go about your, your daily business here in Durham. I'd like to put that, that question to you as to what your one main personal takeaway from the situation would be going forward. Yeah, I think it's a very good question because I think there was such an experience you just, I think you just learn how to deal with, with uh, the most difficult situations there are. I mean, um, you, you can exercise uh, as, as many as you like, you can practice as, as many as you like, but once, once you're on operation, you know, things can get really different than you, than you, than you plan. So, um, because of all the training, well, you certainly gain confidence, which I think lasts a lifetime. And, and you, you also really learn that, that how to look after yourself and how important it is to also have some, some, some like downtime every now and then, because everyone needs recharging to be able to continue performing at your very best. Um, so yeah, I think that my takeaway is that, that it's also that there's always the, the ability to learn to put things in perspective, um, be it through military humor or just by, by writing it off. Um, so you're always able also to, to get like that extra mile and that, 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 yeah, it also helps you just keeping calm under almost all circumstances, I guess. I think those are, really resonate those points on resilience and, and building resilience. James, is there anything you'd like to add about a personal takeaway for the future? Well, I, I really agree. And um, I think it, you know, my experience in Afghanistan uh, really uh, left a huge impression on me and it put life in perspective. Uh, and I, I think about it, you know, I still, I still think about it because of that. And uh, I suppose that's, you know, in, in one way, gratitude that it, it, you've seen what the, um, what the world is like in a very tough place and you're thankful not to be, uh, you know, experiencing what some of, some of the Afghans were experiencing. Um, and, uh, and, and also just sort of gen more general resilience, I think, uh, of knowing how, or trying to stay calm, whatever the situation, and just uh, focusing on the task at hand. And, and that, that sort of skill was, was really enhanced by being in quite an acute operational environment. Thank you. I, I think um, that probably draws us to, to time now. So I think. What I'd like to do is really thank the panellists for sharing those really absorbing and thought-provoking and inspiring and, you know, in, in some cases quite entertaining experiences about what's been happening. But I think, you know, we've learned a lot from this session today about resilience and I think that hopefully those dialing in will be able to take away some of those lessons and, and as well. And I, I don't want to any kind of final reflections you want to, to make on what we've heard as well. No, I, I just feel awed by, um, by the fact that, you know, Everyone that we've heard from today has given so much and now is on a second part or possibly third part for, for some of you of their career and we get the benefit of a, of a lot of that experience. And then I suppose the final thing is just to thank everyone for dialing in. Um, we really appreciate it and you know our sort of networks within Clifford Chance that support the armed forces go from strength to strength and we'll be looking to do more of these sorts of sessions. So look out. Thank you.